Good afternoon, everyone. Excuse me a moment. Jamie, can you stop calling me? Thank you. <laughs> uh, that's a great reminder. If I can get everybody to please silence their phones. Um, I know we remind everyone every time we do this. Um, there was that one person yesterday. Um, <laughs> So I, we're not going to show the video today, but I want to make sure that everybody, uh, if you haven't already uh, learned about it, the T-coil opportunities that we have here at the Library and Observatory. Um, and if you haven't heard about it, it is a T-coil. If you have a hearing aid um, or a hearing assistance device, uh, you can hear that device directly into your ear. Um, and for more information, come talk to one of our staff members. Um, like I said, I'm not going to show the video at every uh, particular talk, but I want to make sure that uh, everybody knows about it. So, I, I like it. Um, as you walked in, you should have gotten our December through February program guide. If you have not, it's going to be on the way on the outside. Um, we have a full action-packed library and observatory and writer series uh, program uh, schedule. So please uh, take a look at that. Thank you. I wanted to take a moment and just talk about the Writers' Festival. What is the Writers' Festival? The Writers' Festival is a world-class gathering of the finest writers who contribute to the intellectual vitality of our time. Our mission is to bring our readers a rich, diverse program with topics ranging from politics, history, humor, health, from all genres, literary and literary fiction. Our writers are all experts in their field, 
distinguished historians, respected journalists, and gifted storytellers. That is brought to you by our executive team and our founder, Jamie Kavler. I also want to take a moment to acknowledge the people that I always hear, well, why are they in the front rows? Um, the people that are in our front rows are our angels, and they are the sponsors of our writer series and our writers festival. To the tune of over 90% of our expenses are covered by our angels. So to our angels that are in the front few rows, thank you. Over the course of the last few weeks, we've talked about how many books were given away, and that's just under uh, 4,500 books over a 22 program span. I've also heard in the back, and so I wanna make sure we hear uh, from me as a director, why it is 200 books. 200 books in the writer series is a give back to our community. So not only are you getting these amazing authors on our uh, stage, but for the first 200 people, they're getting a the free book. Those free books are equivalent to almost $100,000 in expenditures for our festival. That is why we cannot offer 340 books to every attendee at every program. Um, so I want to just make sure that, you, uh, that our attendees, I know you guys are very well appreciative of the books and the authors that we are providing, but just kind of give you some context as to the reason why we've chosen uh, these authors and the, books, the amount of books that we're doing. Um, last week, uh, we had a pro, or, I'm sorry, two weeks ago, we had a program. We had to turn away 50 people from our audience, okay? We don't want to do that. However, we are limited to the capacity in this room. So if you are not able to make it, we are live streaming every single one of these programs on the Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory YouTube page. If you cannot attend at 2 o'clock or whatever time we might be doing it, we also have it filmed, and so it is on our YouTube page almost instantaneous for you to review it at your leisure. It goes back all the way to the 2018 festival and all of our writer series. So please take a look at those. Um, on one of our uh, speakers, we have over, I believe, a million views. So next week, we've got two programs, or I'm sorry, we've got two more programs that I wanna talk about. Uh, on Thursday, this Thursday, November 10th, we have James Burroughs in conversation with David Lee. Burroughs has spent five decades making America laugh as a director for The Friends, Cheers, Taxi, Will and Grace, Mary Tyler Moore Show, and more. And no, I did not get to watch the Mary Tyler Show live. I was a little too young. <laughs> Lee is a co-creator of Wings and Frasier, for which he wrote, produced, and directed. It is going to be an amazing conversation. We know this room is going to be filled up, so please get here early. And then, again, on Monday, November 14th, a new time, 11 a.m. Doors will open at 10, 11 a.m. We have Patrick Raiden Keith. He is the author of Empire of Pain, and it is a grand, devastating portrait of the three generations of the Sackler family, famed for their philanthropy, whose fortune was built on Valium, and whose reputation was destroyed by Oxycontin. We know that's gonna be busy, so please get here early as well. Uh, for those of you in attendance today that got your free book, um, Jeffrey will be signing books at the end of it, so please line up on this side here, and we will get you uh, signed books, as, or I'm sorry, not, yeah, signed books as quickly as possible. For today's program, Jeffrey Frank was a senior editor at the New Yorker, the deputy editor at the Washington Post Outlook section, is the author of Ike and Dick, which hopefully over 200 of you have in your hand. He has published four novels, among them, the Was of, um, among them The Washington Trilogy, The Colonist, Bad Publicity, and Trudy Hopedale, and is a co-author with his wife, Diana Crone Frank, who is in attendance with us today. And they have a new translation on Hans Christian Andersen's stories which won the 2014 Hans Christian Andersen Prize. Uh, Jeffrey is a contributor to The New Yorker and has written for The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, The Guardian, Book Forum, and Vogue, among other publications. Please join me in welcoming 
from Jeffrey Frank. Thank you all for, for coming out today. I, I, I know that California rain can be discouraging, so it was, it was great, great to see so many of you. Um, I, um, people asked me why I wrote about, why I was interested in Eisenhower and Nixon. I, I grew up in Washington, and I grew up in Washington when Eisenhower was, was president. He was this national hero. Uh, he was the, 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 command, the, the commander of the, of the, of the NATO, of the, of, I'm sorry, the Western forces in the, in, in the war. He, he was the one who, who led the, who led the uh, victory against Nazi Germany. And so he was this legendary hero, and he fascinated all of us, and he was kind of a distant person. There were these huge parades for him when he came home after the war in New York and in, in Washington. Nixon was a different story. Nixon was a, Nixon was a, was, was a much more accessible person. Um, he had, he, um, apart from his um, reputation, which was as, as, a, as a tough, a, a tough and maybe over tough fighter, he was, we saw him. He was, a, he was one of us, a Washingtonian. I would see him at baseball games. I would be at the upper deck at Griffith Stadium as a kid, and looking down, there would be Richard Nixon or Dick Dick Nixon, and he was so he was one of us. So, he, so it was a it was an interesting couple of, of people. And the, people would ask me, didn't they hate each other? And the answer is no, they did not hate each other. It was a very interesting, complicated relationship that lasted for twenty years, and that's and that's the that's the book I tried to write and. Uh, and, I, and I, as I wrote it, I began to sort of see them in different ways. This, the sort of idea that Richard Nixon was this, this, this evil, evil, and 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 gut gut fighting guy, and and that Eisenhower was was this benign, uh, happy, sort of great, kind man. Was they, they weren't? It wasn't quite that. And they and it was much, I say, much much more interesting than, than that. And that's why, and this, and that's why I, I got into this book, and I got. And, it, and then, as one does when one begins a story like this, what you become obsessed by it. You learn more and more, and you meet more and more people. And um, and I'll talk about that later. I met a lot of people who were no longer with us. One of I met one person who who died the day after I met her. So it was it was like that. There, it, it's a it was a different generation, but it was a fascinating story for me. And I hope that I hope that I hope that it's interesting for, for you. Um, I um, Nixon got his start in politics. He came back from the war. He was what he didn't know what he was going to do, but then sort of some Republicans in 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 Orange County saw him. This man from Whittier, he had already begun a law, become a lawyer. He was working as a prosecutor, and he, and he had lots of virtues. He had I mean, as a candidate, possible candidate. He was a uh, he was a war a war veteran and uh, had, had had a good record. He was a he was a great debater a debater, and he was a young man. And he was be facing a man named Jerry Voorhees, who was the, the Democrat who'd been in for several terms, and who was considered a vulnerable uh, opponent. And uh, so Nixon ran in 1946, and he won. Uh, it was it was an interesting class of of, of congressmen coming in. Uh, Jack Kennedy also won that that year, and they uh, and the, the Kennedy and Nixon became f friends. Uh, and Kennedy invited Nixon to his to his wedding, and they were. I say it was an interesting, interesting class of, of, of congressmen in 1946, um, and, uh, and and so Nixon Nixon was on, on his way, and he became he became known for taking part in the the, the House on American Activities Committee, and 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 uh, and he became a uh, became known as kind of a, a red hunter. And in, when he ran for the Senate, uh, he he had a chance to run for the Senate in, in 1950, and he saw that. And that's when he began the Nixon that people, the, 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 the sort of tough red hunter that people know of today. He, he was, his opponent was a Democrat named Helen Gahagan Douglas, who was a, a sort of celebrated movie star. And she, she'd already been a, a, a senator. And she was, also, she was also, as we later have learned, he was, she was also the mistress of Lyndon Johnson. And, uh, and, Nixon, and Nixon really took her on, and it was a, that, was, that was maybe his meanest campaign. It was the campaign that people who began to hate Nixon never forgave him for. He went after Douglas. He, didn't, he never called her a communist, but he would say, well, she's pink right down to her underwear, and things like that. And people, people remembered that, and they didn't, and they did, they didn't like it. And, uh, but, and Nixon won that race in 1950, and, uh, and, he, um, and so he became a, a U.S. senator. And... Uh, and that wasn't the end of his of his rise. Um, in 19, he then there was Eisenhower, who he met for, he met Eisenhower twice. The first time, here's a 
you can't really see them very carefully. I'm just looking here. You can see Isaac, Herbert Hoover is at the head of the table. This is the Bohemian Grove. And I was, felt so lucky to find this picture. Um, you can see Nixon four, four down on the left. And uh, on the right, uh, there's Eisenhower, who was the guest speaker. He was, the, he, he was, gonna be, he was gonna give the lakeside talk. And it wasn't a great speech, and many of the people there did not want him as the candidate. They wanted Robert Taft. But, uh, but, but, uh, but anyway, Nixon and Eisenhower met, and, uh, and Nixon was, came away very impressed by him. And, uh, and Nixon, by the way, had seen Eisenhower once before. When Eisenhower had his great victory parade in New York after the war, Nixon was there. Nixon was there. Nixon was at the top floor of a building looking down, and he said he never forgot. He never forgot the sight of this man. He felt, he sort of felt his, his, his greatness coming up at him, and he remembered, he remembered that Eisenhower would have this, he would raise his hands like this, and that was a gesture that Nixon picked up later on in his career, and, uh, and um, so um, Nixon, um, Eisenhower was, was being boosted as a candidate for president. He was, he was actually being boosted for president as early as 1946, actually 1948, I was said, no, I don't want anything to do with this. I've had my, I've sort of had my, my run now. But he was basically pushed, pushed into it. And, um, and, 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 he, and he, he, his, his opponent was Robert Taft, the senator from Ohio, was very conservative. And Eisenhower was, a, was an internationalist. He was, and he had a different, different view. And he, um, so he, he it, was a, it was an interesting convention. He won the nomination. And then he had to find a vice president, or pick a vice president. And Richard Nixon was being promoted by a group of people who knew, who, who sort of knew him and sort of were trying to, trying to, to, to boost this ticket. Nixon had many virtues. He, had, he was a Westerner. Um, he was a, uh, as a, a, a veteran. He was young. Eisenhower was 62 years old when he ran for president. That was considered, he was sort of a grandfatherly 62. One doesn't think of that as being an old man, but, uh, but there, there, were, there were times where he actually was, he was, he was not in great shape. I mean, he looked good, but he was a, he was a heavy smoker. He had smoked four packs a day during the war, and he cut down. One of his doctors said, well, if you cut down to one pack a day, that'll be fine. That's not going to hurt you. <laughs> so, uh, so but his, 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 medical, his medical care was not, was not, the, not the best, as you'll, as you'll hear. Um, and uh, so that was the convention. That was the program of the 1952 convention. That was a different kind of Republican Party then. And... Uh, and here's the, after the nominations, after Nixon and Eisenhower were both nominated, here's the, the sort of traditional victory, victory uh, thing. And Eisenhower hated that. Eisenhower hated being touched. And Nixon didn't know that. And he, 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 said, he said later on, I found he was, he was sort of pulling away from me. And, uh, and, and so it was, a, it was sort of an, un, the, the very, at the very beginning, it was sort of a, an awkward relationship. But, uh, but they were, but they were, they were a team, and they, and Eisenhower would, would sort of take the high ground, sort of, and Nixon would take, Nixon would do what vice presidential candidates do. He would be tough and fierce, and he would go after, and he would go after the um, the, the opponent, who happened to be Adlai Stevenson, and uh, and he really, um, it was a, it was it was actually he was he, Stevenson was was sort of widely respected even by Eisenhower, was respected by Eisenhower, but he was not, he was a perfect. Foil for, foil for Nixon and Eisenhower. And, and Stevenson didn't even want the nomination. Stevenson, I get into this in my, my book about Truman. Stevenson said, well, Eisenhower is probably going to win this, and, and, and isn't it really time for a change? Uh, the Democrats had been in office since 19, 1932. Um, this was after the, um, a, a sort of in, in Chicago, but as, as they get ready to set out. And, uh, and here, after they won the election, Eisenhower tried to, was starting to groom Nixon. Here they are. They were going on a fishing trip together. Nixon knew nothing about fi about fi fishing, about fly fishing, and so he was. And there was there's a video of him. You can see him trying to cast a, cast a fish, and you, the thing gets t tangled up in his coat, and he's trying to undo it. And it's, he's, he, Nixon had this sort of charming awkwardness that, uh, or un or sort of strange awkwardness. And this was, and this was. <laughs> so you can see you can see they they look as if they're having a pretty good time together, but they're Nixon was suffering. Um, now this. Here, here, here comes the problem. Six sex erased. Six sex erased is not the story. The story is above that in the secret Nixon fund. And the New York Post had reported that a group of, of, of wealthy Republican donors had supported Nixon 
um, given Nixon a, sort of an extra salary while he was in Congress. I mean, supported him and uh, helped him survive. And uh, it wasn't really such a big deal. It was, um, he, it really wasn't that much money, and it wasn't, and it actually wasn't a secret. Nixon had, been, Nixon had been asked about it and talked about it, but it was a great headline, and it sort of m ballooned into a real problem for Nixon. It was Nixon's secret fund. And in fact, Adlai Stevenson had a fund that was even more secret and much larger, but that, that never became a problem for Stevenson. But it became a huge problem for the Eisenhower-Nixon ticket, and, and particularly for Eisenhower, who, who, was, who was running as this, as he would say, clean as a hound's tooth. And, uh, and there were people basically were saying Nixon should be get, there was pressure to get Nixon off the ticket, to get make Nixon resign the ticket. And there was this, it was really painful. It went on for, for, for a while, and finally, finally Nixon said, um, well, Eisenhower said to Nixon, I think you'd better explain yourself. And Nixon said, all right. And this was, this was torture for Nixon. He had to go on television and explain how the, this, where this money went, where it came from, how, and why he was an honest, honest man. So he went to the El Capitan Theater in Hollywood, which is where the shows like This Is Your Life were being broadcast. And Nixon, by, by the way, I'm sorry, that's a note that Eisenhower said, make, be sure to tune in. <laughs> And, and uh, so uh, that's 6.30 Pacific uh, Standard Time. Here's the Nixon delivering the so-called, it was a, the so-called checkers speech. And Nixon, Nixon held forth and said, um, this was, you know, I, I did, did I, did, did, was, did I receive money? Yes, and here, and there, there, there are records of it. Did my wife, was my wife on the payroll? Yes, there are records of this. Did I do anything dishonest? There's nothing that, nothing that I'm trying to hide from anyone and my, my record is clear. And he and it was and he it was he was suffering. He was terrified. He had no idea how this went down. And when he got off the air, or just before, I'm sorry, just before he went on the air, he got a phone call from Tom Dewey, the governor of New York, who had been a big Nixon supporter. And Dewey said, "Dick, when you, here's the word: when you finish your speech, we want you to then announce that you're resigning from the ticket." And Nixon said, "You just watch me." And he Nixon, this was this was his lowest moment. He, he at one point he said, "I don't know whether I can go on." He asked one of his friends, get, who was a, a friend who was a Catholic, get the sisters to pray for me. He was just in agony, but and he had no idea how he done. He was cut off before the end of the speech, and he walked outside, and suddenly people were cheering. And he and then it turns out it turns out as it, it was a huge hit. It was the there had been nothing like it before. And Nixon, uh, you have to sort of watch this. Uh, you can see vision, verses of it on YouTube. But it was a great speech in the sense that it was so effective. Nixon said, Nixon, Nixon's key moment was, my, my wife has a, has a cloth coat, not a mink coat. There, there had been a mink coat scandal in Truman's, in the Truman administration. And he said, the one thing we really did receive, and I should report it now, was a little dog, a dog we called Checkers. And, and, Checkers, uh, and it, Checkers got his nickname from my daughter, Tricia, and they're not going to take that dog away from me. So that became, that became known as the, as the Checkers speech. And it was, it, it, a lot of critics said, well, it was very maudlin and so on, but it was also really effective. And that, and that, really, that sort of saved Nixon, but it, um, but it was also really, it never, he never really got over that. Um, I would say years later, he would say, I, I, he, would, he would remember the anniversary of the, what, of the Checker speech and say to his family, this is, this is the day, it was September 23rd. And um, his wife said it was, the, I would, couldn't talk about it, Pat Nixon couldn't talk about it. It was, so, it was so, such, an, such an agony for both of them. Um, after that, <laughs> Eisenhower basically said, come, come meet me, we'll, we'll, we'll meet, in, we'll meet in, in West Virginia and catch, and catch up and get things going again. And this is Nixon talking to Senator Nolan after, afterward, and he, was, he broke down and cried. And this, is, this, this, this picture was everywhere. He was, he was really, he, he was a man, uh, a man in, in, in great pain. And uh, um, oh, there was, and then there, oh, there's Senator McCarthy. And this was, this was one, Eisenhower would give Nixon these tasks to do. Um, when it, later on, it became taking on Senator McCarthy. But right away, he gave him a big assignment. Oh, I'm sorry, I should, I, forgive me for that. I should go back. He gave him the assignment to sort of go and travel. He sent him away for 68 days, traveling all, all over Asia and, and getting, to know, getting to know world leaders in Pakistan, in India, in, and, and, and in Vietnam. And, and it was a, an education for Nixon. Can you imagine today a vice president being sent out on a learning tour for 68 days? And it was tough. I mean, it was tough. They had two little kids at home. I mean, Tricia was six years old. Julie was four years old. Nixon's mother, Hannah, came in from California to babysit for two months. But it was a real, it was, it was, but it was a real education. And, uh, and, and, uh, and Nixon, Nixon learned, learned a lot. When he came back, 
Um, when he came back, Eisenhower greeted him at the White House and said, uh, thank you, thank you, Dick, good, good job. We'll talk about this later. They never talked about it. That was the end of that. But, but, but Nixon, Nixon really got a, a, lot, a lot out of it. And, um, and as I say, he later, um, he, he later, he later was told to, to take, on, take on Senator McCarthy, and he, he did that too, which was a painful thing for, for an, a, an anti-communist, a red hunter like, like, like Nixon. Then come, in 1955, Eisenhower, um, Eisenhower was, was in Denver playing golf, and he, um, he had a heart attack. And it, was a, and it was a serious coronary. No one had any idea. And when he, the night it happened, he was in, he was in the, um, he, was, he, he, had, he woke up in the middle of the night feeling chest pains. And his wife said, well, it must be indigestion. Nixon had real problems with indigestion. So his wife said, well, let's call, let's call Dr. Snyder. Dr. Snyder was not a very good doctor, but Dr. Snyder came over and sat with him and gave him, he was, are you in pain? And he said, yeah, and he gave him morphine. And, and, and someone said for about, for several hours, the President of the United States was being, and had had a major heart attack and no one knew about it. And it was, uh, the next day, they realized this was serious and he was transferred to the Army Hospital. And he stayed there for 55 days. It was a very serious coronary. And then it became, what's, 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 next, for, what's next for Eisenhower? And also, what's next for Dick Nixon? Um, there, was, there was talk, is, I mean, Eisenhower died, Nixon was the president, and he would, people began to look at him in a different, different way. Vice presidents were traditionally considered sort of jokes, and Nixon, and Nixon was someone who was considered not only, not only not ready for the presidency, but someone who was, a lot of people didn't trust and didn't like. So this was a, this was a very, very hard time, and, uh, and oh, just say, say I'll call back. I, I probably <laughs> so. And, and so this was a, and, and, and then, then they began to talk who's gonna, who's going to, who's gonna run if Eisenhower does, and then also Eisenhower himself couldn't make up his mind. Is he gonna seek, seek another term? And, uh, and then it took, to say, it, took a, it took a while for Eisenhower to say he's gonna, he's gonna go ahead, and then when Eisenhower decided to run again, then Nixon was still, there was no, Eisenhower hadn't settled on his tick, the ticket yet, so Eisenhower put Nixon through the same thing he'd been put through with checkers, but in, in a different way. There were months and months of, of, of agony again. Was he going to be on the ticket or not? Nick, I, there, were, there was talk that he should be forced, that he should leave. Eisenhower at one point had a conversation with him and said, well, why don't you become Secretary of Defense and learn how to be an administrator? And Nixon was trying to do anything to stay where he was. He knew that if he left the ticket, if he left the ticket, he'd be, it would be perceived that he'd been dumped by Eisenhower. So, so, they, so this, went, this went on and on. And, uh, at one point, Len Hall, the Republican national chairman, was told just to tell, tell Nixon, you're out, you're gone, it's, it's, all, it's all done. And Hall did tell him, but somehow it didn't quite get through. Hall didn't quite say it straight. And then Eisenhower would say, well, I'm waiting for Dick Nixon to chart his own course. And, and then there was a long sort of, of sort of no one said, no one really spoke to each other, no one spoke directly. Nixon never said, Mr. President, I want to, be, I want to run with you again. But finally, there came a time when Nixon visited the Oval Office and and said it, and that took a long, long time to, to get straight. And then, and then, um, and then, they, and then they, the, the, the 1956 ticket was settled. But it was, a, it was another really painful thing. And you ask about the relationship between Eisenhower and Nixon. It was months of indecision, of suspense, and of kind of worry, and particularly for, for much more for Nixon. And then Eisenhower is a question of, of his health. He was a 60, say, he was 62, but it was not a, he was not a healthy 62 at this point. Um, but here's, here they, this was the second inaugural. Nixon and Eisenhower had won. They, they won in, in a landslide against Stevenson again. And, uh, and uh, they were, and here's a picture that, um, it, looks, it looks as if David Eisenhower, who is second from, second from the left, is, is fascinated with Julie, Julie Nixon, <laughs> who's right there. And turn, it turns out that the, what was really happening and there, there, the grandfather, uh, the um, grandfather and father, he was fascinated, Julie had a black eye. And Julie had gotten this black eye from a sledding accident, and, and David was just fascinated by it. He couldn't take his eyes off it, or at least that's the story that I was told. And, uh, and, uh, uh, here's Nixon in, 19, in the summer of 1957, when Ghana, the, uh, the Gold Coast, became independent. Um, Nixon was suggested, why don't you go, why don't you go join the, 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 the delegation? And, uh, and it became a really important moment for Nixon. Nixon became friends with Martin Luther King there. And uh, he became, when the showboy was, was what some of the local papers called, that was a compliment. A compliment was sort of a, a man who really makes an impression. He was, this was a whole different Nixon. This is the uptight, 
California. This was, this was a Nixon who was picking up babies and Pat Nixon with him when they were hugging people. And it was just the most, he was a huge hit. And, and he, was, he was also a huge hit with, 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 with Dr. King, with Martin Luther King. And they, they became very friendly. And King said, I'd like to come by and see you when I get back. And because of Shakur, of course. And, and this, was the, this was the summer of 57. And that fall was the, the, this new civil rights bill was coming along. And Nixon, was, Nixon basically became the leader of this, of this, of this bill, which was, which was basically going to ensure vo voting rights. In 19, this, was the most, this was the most advanced civil rights bill since 1875. And, uh, and it was opposed by people like, I mean opposed, it was gently opposed by people like Lyndon Johnson and, and Richard Russell, the Southerners, and they tried to, all kinds of things to try to weaken it. One of, the, one, of their, one of their ploys was to sort of, for any case about there was gonna deny voting rights to, a, to an African American, um, they wanted a jury trial, knowing darn well that if a jury trial in the South on this was not gonna, was not gonna bring, a, bring a, a result. So they, Nixon, Nixon and, and, and the administration won on that and, and, and they were, so it, it was a really big deal, and King was very grateful to Nixon for, for seeing this through. He was, he was really the leader of this, of this bill. And you, see, you don't think of Nixon as being, Nixon later on in life became identified with a so-called Southern strategy. But Nixon was also, this was the other side of Nixon. King, Dr. King would say, well, he was, he's a Quaker. I don't see any prejudice in this man. There was some prejudice, but Nixon was, Nixon was, pretty, was, it was pr pretty genuinely open to, open to, to, to this sort of reform. Um, and here's a here's Nixon greeting um, greeting Dr. King, and uh, and uh, this is probably this is probably around the, around the time that the civil civil rights bill was was being passed. It was it was a successful um, management of that bill. Um, ah, hit, the fall of '57 that was after the civil rights bill was a very very difficult time. There was the civil rights bill. There was also the the um, the Little Rock crisis. The uh, the the uh, the, uh, the, 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 the integration of, 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 of the high school in Little Rock was being st stopped by, by Governor Faubus, and uh, Eisenhower actually finally had to order in troops to integrate, to sort of bring in the, the, the Little Rock uh, students in, into, the, into the school. And this was a hugely stressful moment. On top of that, and on top of the Civil Rights Bill, R the Russia had sent Sputnik into space, the first, the first satellite, the first uh, artificial satellite. And, uh, so all these things were happening at once, and there was a lot of, it was a, obviously a difficult time for Eisenhower. One evening, he was gonna host, he was gonna be the host for the, for the president of Morocco. There was a state dinner, and, it, and as he was getting dressed, he suddenly couldn't speak. He didn't know what was happening. He said, he, um, he, he, said, um, he couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't say the word for mirror. The word for floor became ceiling, and he was having a stroke. And no one, and this was, this was really, after the heart attack, this was really something scary. For, for everyone, I mean, I mean, Sherman Adams, Nixon's chief of staff, told told Nixon, "You may be president in the next 24 hours," and no one knew what what, what, the, what this meant. No one, no one had ever seen this before. Um, for John Foster Dulles, the Secretary of State, um, he he was he remembered what had happened when Woodrow Wilson had a stroke and this is, and and couldn't and simply couldn't 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 govern. So this was another this was another huge thing, and this was Nixon. Nixon. This became Nixon at his best. He really managed to. To do to 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 step forward and show himself taking charge and not and not pushing himself as if he was going to be the one running anything. He was very diplomatic, very careful. At at one point, at one point, he was asked, "What should the, what do you see your role as?" And he said, "Well, I'm the vice president. I I will be the vice president." And he was very very good at that, and and he became and he won lots of points from from uh, from everyone, including. Well, not really Eisenhower. Eisenhower was never very grateful for any any kind of help like that. But he was. But Nixon. It was a great. It was a great moment for Nixon. He. You could actually see him growing. People said he. he almost uh, people almost use the word statesmanlike for Nixon. And Eisenhower was meanwhile recovering. He, Eisenhower said, "I'm going to go to. I'm going to go to this NATO conference in two weeks." And I was like, "You can't do that. Just, you know, you, he's had he's had this stroke. It was a, turned out to be a minor stroke. He never quite got over it. He he would forget words and he would forget." And he would lose track of things, but he was, but he was basically, he basically made a full recovery. And uh, this, here's the picture of Eisenhower heading off to Paris for this NATO conference two weeks later. And uh, would, I'm sort of, if you look at their faces, I'm not sure how well you can see them, but they're, the expressions on Nixon's face and on Eisenhower's face just kind of fascinates me. I'm not quite sure what, what it tells me, but they were, it was a very, it was, they were, they were really, they were really, um, I just, I just can't imagine. Actually, I just can't quite imagine what was going through their minds. Here's. People were worried about Eisenhower being able to survive a trip like this. 
Nixon clearly was too, because for all kinds of reasons. And then, but Eisenhower made the trip, and he came back, and it was a, it was a, it was a pretty good, pretty good trip. Ah, then I'm, I'm jumping ahead now to, to, to the next presidential campaign, and uh, there was a lot of talk. I mean, Nixon was became very quickly the front runner for the Republicans. Um, the uh, there was no real no really no competition. The, the only real serious competition was from Nelson Rockefeller, the governor of New York. And Nixon did not like Rockefeller. Rockefeller did not like Nixon. And Rockefeller was a pretty good, was pretty good at reading the, the political landscape. And he saw that he really wouldn't have a chance against Nixon. Nixon was really the favorite of the of the Republican old guard, the Republican mainstream, the old guard. And he, and so that was the um, that was the, uh, the coming. Up. And Nixon began to sort of use um, television. This is this had never been this would never happened before. Using talk shows to talk about. You know, to, to talk about this, to sort of chat and so on. He well, he was on the Jack Parr show. And this was that um, Jack Kennedy, who became the Democratic candidate, was also on the Parr show. And Kennedy was actually Kennedy was much more much much more adept at television than than, than Nixon was. But it was a, it was a very different kind of campaign. And here is the famous 1960 debate, the first the first of its kind. And uh, and that was. Um, you could somehow, somehow the, the pictures sort of set, sort of told you who won. It's it was, but but on, on the on the radio, everyone agreed that Nixon won. Nixon won on the radio. JFK won on on television. But television beat beat radio, and it was it was a, as you know, it was a very close election. So close that some say that it was that that that, that, that I mean, Kennedy won it, but some say that it was actually Nixon. I mean, Nixon Nixon won. It was was it stolen? I don't know. There's a lot of debate about that still. Um, Nixon. Um, <laughs> Nixon um, lost um, Chicago, I mean Illinois, and he lost and uh, and he lost Texas. Lyndon, Lyndon Johnson was running with Kennedy, and uh, who knows? But I mean, I think there's a, there's a very good case to be made that that Nixon would have won. That on a, in a fair cat, Nixon would have won. But um, but anyway, but Kennedy obviously won won the election. Um, let me turn this. Go back one. Um, um, the it was a um, it was a tough. Tough, 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 tough election, though. I mean, Nixon at the end of it, I, I, I wrote about this. Nixon was, Nixon took a, a drive with his with his military aide, a, a major general Don Hughes, and they drove from Los Angeles down to Tijuana for a Mexican lunch, and that and that was Nixon again. He just said he he remembered doing this as a, as a boy when he was young and he grew up in Southern California, and and then when he came when but then late at night he found out that he had, he he had, he he lost and. Uh, and uh, and that and then and then he had nothing. His future then was very much in doubt. He was he, he became a uh, he he sort of ended what he came to, came to call the wilderness years. What was next? What was going to be next for this guy? Um, Kennedy was president. He knew that Kennedy was going to run again for sure in 1964, and he would certainly win. Incumbents do, always won, so he had to figure out what he was going to do. So he became he he changed his life. He he moved to California, and he went, I can't live out here. I mean, even though he was a Californian, he said, What do people do out here? And he sat in an apartment on, on Wilshire Boulevard, and he, so then he he became a uh, he became a lawyer. He was a lawyer, and he, he and he became a, a sort of name partner with his firm in, in in New York. And he became, and he had a whole different kind of life suddenly. His his family moved to New York. They would go to the theater. They would walk. They would, you, people saw them walking checkers along along Fifth Avenue. He he lived in the same building, the same apartment building that Nelson Rockefeller, where Nelson Rockefeller lived, and uh, and he. Um, and that and that was going to be his life, except that something happened. Jack Kennedy was shot, and uh, Nixon was coming back from Dallas on the day Kennedy was 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 murdered, and uh, and and suddenly everything changed. He began to talk. He began to talk to Republicans again. He had he had always told Pat his life on will never do this again, but but he couldn't he couldn't he couldn't stop himself. So so there was so there was um there was a uh, there were constant meetings with. Uh, in, in, 19, in 1964, Nixon, Nixon even thought that he might even be able to get the nomination and run against whomever the Republicans were, were, were going to put up. But he, but as it turned out, that he, I, I'm sorry, that, I mean, the, the, whoever the Democrats were going to put up, but Lyndon Johnson, but he, that didn't didn't happen. But he was, but he was already in 1964 after, after after Johnson beat Larry Goldwater, he was already planning, looking ahead. He was a very very smart politician. He was already looking ahead to 1968, and he saw this plan. For, to, in 1966, to win, to help win Congress, to help the Republicans win Congress, and they and and he helped camp, he campaigned for them all over the place, and 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 he sort of realized that not only would the Republicans win Congress, 
but that every every member, every 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 new congressman would be a delegate to the 1968 convention. So he was he was he was really sort of he really saw a future now, sort of a, a way in. He, he wasn't going to be he wasn't gonna, it wasn't going to be easy, and he also understood that the Republican Party was already changing, and he understood that if. If the if the Repub if the Republicans went with their heart, Ronald Reagan would have been the nominee in 1968. But but Nixon was Nixon was the was the Paul. Nixon knew what he was doing, and Nixon was the organizer. And he and he managed to, to pull it off and get and get the get the get, get the nomination. Um, and uh, so there was no one. So he um, so he was ready to. Anyway, he was but he was still traumatized by 1960. He couldn't believe that he never really gotten over that. He was. It was, it was, he was traumatized in the sense that he thought he'd won, he thought he was cheated, and he was never gonna let that happen again. And, and, he, uh, and, and it, it, it didn't then. Uh, he was, and he became a, um, he, he became the, um, I was gonna say the, 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 the sort of a, a new kind of, he was a new version of himself. And he was a, uh, and he, this, the, he, he was not gonna become, he was not gonna, he was no longer gonna live the life of the, of the, of the prosperous lawyer. He once said, I, I wasn't going to go and live in Palm Springs or Palm Beach. I was going to be, I was going to. He, he, he just couldn't stop it. And then, and it was a really, really tough campaign. For, again, all of Nixon's campaigns were were, 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 were very tough. And Eisenhower saw him at one point. He people. He had this reputation as as a loser. Eisenhower once said, saw Nixon walking along, sort of hunched over, and said, said to Len Hall, "He doesn't look like a winner to me." And uh, and that was the sort of reputation he had. And people people would. He, he, was, he had something he couldn't he couldn't shake, and right down to the end of this campaign, he he, he thought that he, you know he just he just didn't know. But then things were, other things were happening at this point. Um, his daughter Julie had become engaged to uh, what can I say? Um, no, that, that, Eisenhower had was by the way Eisenhower was back in the hospital again. I should I should say, and uh, he had another heart attack, and he was at Walter Reed. And that's, this was this was the day he was being serenaded outside his window at Walter Reed. That was this was in October of '68. In December of '68, Julie Julie Nixon and David Eisenhower got married, and that became a that became part of the campaign too. Um, David 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 would David and Julie would go, would go from uh, go around and campaign for this for this ticket. It was it was a, it was a family affair, and uh, and suddenly the Nixons and the Eisenhowers were one big extended family, uh, and uh, so that was that was a whole that was a whole different sort of life for life for Nixon, um, and he. Uh, so I was going to say, um, and here is the double V that very much looks very much like the Eisenhower victory sign in 19, in 19, uh, 1952. And here's Nixon in 1968, and, and winning the winning winning the election. He um, and uh, and here's the 1969 inaugural parade, um, and it was it was it was a it was as disruptive as you can imagine. The Vietnam War was going on. People were throwing garbage at the at the at the at the motorcade. People were people were calling Nixon a, a war criminal, even though he'd been in office only for a few minutes. So it was it was a very it was an ugly it was an ugly time. Anyone who remembers the Vietnam era will, will know it was it was a very very it was a very u ugly time. And uh, and then and then Nixon the second Nixon's term then became as we all know it became it was it it it, it, it his his obsession with not being not being not losing again and his determination not not to have that happen again. He created a sort of palace guard around himself, and people like H.R. Haldeman and and John Ehrlichman and others. So, and then that became that became the, the that became the Nixon of, of Watergate. And uh, but but at the same time, in 1969, he was still devoted to Eisenhower. He would visit him at Walter Reed, and and I mean he and he he would um, Eisenhower's hold on Nixon was enormous. I mean Nixon really wanted to be in his good graces. He really wanted Eisenhower to think well of him. And it never that that really never really never stopped. And uh, and Eisenhower when Eisenhower died in in um, in, in um, March of 1969. And uh, oh, I'm sorry, I should, oh, yeah, right. um, Eisenhower died in March of 1969. And he and that was um, Nixon broke down in tears. He just said he was such a strong man, and he was. And it, it, it was it was a real a really emotion. And 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 I've always wondered. I mean, if Eisenhower. If Eisenhower had lived, could could all the other stuff have happened? And was Eisenhower was, would would Nixon having such respect for Ike, would would would, would could Watergate have happened? Um, Nixon, Eisenhower's brother Milton thought that that Eisenhower would never he would never have allowed, basically would, could never have let it happen, um, or would have would, would have talked to him. Nixon had such respect for Eisenhower that uh, probably it probably wouldn't. Well, I don't know. I, but I, I suspect that if Eisenhower had lived, 
more than three months into the Nixon presidency, would, we would have had a very different history. Nixon had a very creative three months. Um, there, were, there was a new welfare plan. Uh, he, his, uh, his new uh, security advisor, Henry Kissinger, came to see Eisenhower uh, and to, to, to consult with him and then to report back. I mean, it was, it, it was and then, and then, then, and then, then, then after Ike died, it all went, all, all went bad. Um, and then Nixon, Nixon lived 25 more years. I just want to say that, but I found that as I was doing this, what was so much, what was so interesting to me was meeting the people, all these people who knew them. And I, there, some of them, most of them were still around. I, I was able to talk to Len Garment, for example, who was, who was Nixon's advisor, who, was a, who, who told these wonderful stories about how Nixon would, Nixon, Nixon advised him, don't ever, dis, don't ever come into a room too quickly. Walk slowly into the room. He would, um, he, I talked to, uh, to, to uh, um, I was going to say uh, uh, John Sears, who was a the sort of the legendary political consultant, who who told me how Nixon, when he first came to the White House, he would, after he won the presidency, he would take visitors to the office, to the Oval Office, and show them the, the medals that Eisenhower had won, and just sort of sort of he was instilled in awe of Eisenhower, and that's that still meant a lot of him. Also, I got to know David and Julie. I had a wonderful lunch with David and Julie, and and they and apparently after that, Julie particularly would not stop talking to talking to people about, about her father, and that was sort of it. But when I, I would see, I would, but I would see her later, it's sort of, I would go to things like the Nixon, Nixon reunions and things, and I would, I would hang around, and I would come in, I would walk in and say, hi, Julie. She said, I, I want you to meet so-and-so, I want you to meet so-and-so, and she was, she knew that, she knew that I was gonna ask her more questions, and she didn't, she'd had enough. But we had a very, very good lunch. <laughs> <laughs> but she had a very, and, 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 I, and, I, and I think David and Julie, they never really talked about what a time it must have been for them during Watergate, but they, they survived it. Their marriage is strong. They have kids. One of their, one of their daughters is, was in show business and musical comedy and so on, and they've, they've actually made a, a real life for themselves. And Julie and, uh, and, uh, and David wrote a very good book about, a very good book about his father, and then, and then David and Julie together wrote a very good book about, 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 his, about I mean, his grandfather, uh, a very good book about his, about his grandfather, going, called Going Home to Glory. Um, I got to meet da Bill Scranton, William Scranton. I didn't know William Scranton was alive, and he, was, he, he must have been in his 90s. He was, he was great. I got stories, stories about the 1968 convention and, and, uh, that, 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 that no one else could have known. Actually, Scranton was being pushed for... As, as, a, as a possible candidate in 1964, when the, during the Goldwater, the Goldwater uh, candidacy, um, there were um, Helen Thomas, the, the the sort of the newswoman who was who was sort of so, who was sort of sort of very uh, sort of a real a real character, uh, Ray, Raymond K. Price, who was the who was the, who was the editorial page editor of the Herald Tribune, and he became Nixon's uh, chief speechwriter, along with along with a guy named Pat Buchanan. They kind of shared shared duties. Pat Buchanan would do the the right wing uh, take off the bark pieces, and and Ray Price would do the sort of statesman like statesman like pieces of of, of uh, looking looking forward to uh, to sort of great uh, great visions and so on. And that was that was Ray Price, and he was a much more much gentler kind of, kind of writer. Um, and they were they were um, it was just a lot of people. People I mentioned briefly there was a uh, there was a woman named um, one of the people that Julie suddenly introduced me to um, was um, uh, uh, was a uh, Woman who died a, a week later, or, or I'm sorry, a day later. I mean, she went home. It wasn't. I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't. She was in an auto accident. And I was. She, I had said. She had said, "Call me later on." And I said, "Yeah, let's just let's just sit here and talk for a few minutes." And she was, she was someone who had worked in Nixon's office when he was in Congress. So there was people, people like that. And they're all gone. There are a few people left who were from that time. But I was so lucky to get to know them and to and I got to really like them. There was a really. It was a really interesting time. There was a guy, uh, people, people who were on the Eisenhower campaign train in 1950 were still around. 1952 were still around, and they were. I could talk, talk, talk to them, and um, and and there were and there were sort of wonderful, wonderful, sort of impressions of, of what it was like. Uh, the, the being with being with Nixon during the Checkers speech was just. It, it was so interesting. People people remembered him going. People remembered him in, 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 in Portland, Oregon, so showing up and going to a synagogue and giving a speech. And this pressure was it never so. People would yell at him, "Where's the where's the where's the money, Dick? Tell us tell tell, tell us tell us where the secret fund is." And there was, so it was just all these people were, were there, and it's just and it's really such such a lost such a lost time. Um, I I uh, the the um, and everything. I, the other thing that was sort of struck me was how different how how I'm sorry how different Eisenhower and Nixon were. And yet, how similar they were in so many ways. Both of them had sort of um, very sort of nurturing mothers. Nixon's 
Nixon, Hannah Nixon was, uh, and, and the same with Eisenhower, and very strict, strict fathers. Both of them grew up, both of them were not main, in mainstream religions. Uh, Nixon was a Quaker. Eisenhower was basically a Mennonite, and he became a Presbyterian after he became president, or, or sort of, he was the, when he was the, uh, the, the, the supreme commander, but he was, but they, they, they had very, very similar, and they both grew up in small towns, Nixon, uh, Nixon in, in, in uh, Whittier, and, uh, and then Yorba Linda, Eisenhower in, in, uh, in, in Abilene, Kansas. Uh, and, and, and they're still, and visiting, visiting the Eisenhower Library, visiting Abilene, you can still see, you can still see, it's still the same place where Eisenhower, Eisenhower grew up. He never lived there again, he went to West Point, but he, but he, he would come back to be, to be, to visit and to be celebrated. He loved being celebrated and, uh, and he would get, he would get these great, great parades. Um, and it was, and he realized that this, 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 these two strange people, these two very different people, it was a real, it was a real partnership. And it, and if they, if they liked each other, I don't know. But but they, but they definitely came to respect each other, and they they were able to work together, and they were able to sort of work together in a creative, creative way. And they made a creative, they had a creative policy. Um, and and they, and they, and became more and more. And Eisenhower was someone. Eisenhower, when he became when he when he left the presidency, he, he wanted to be called general. That he, it was a much tougher job for Eisenhower, being 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 the general who led the Normandy invasion than being president of the United States. That was a much that was much more much more difficult uh, task. And, Jeffrey, uh, do we have time for a few questions? We do. We do. Great. I, I, I would love I would love some questions. Please thank Jeffrey Frank, okay. and we're going to get to some questions. Yeah. Who's got a question? I'm surprised you left out the gubernatorial race that at one point so devastated. I know, Nixon. no, there's so much I've left out. I know. Okay. Yeah, after I should tell you this. After after Nixon lost, he became he would he would um, Eisenhower spent part Eisenhower lived pretty close to here part of the part of the year. He would live he would live at the El Dorado Country Club. He had a house there. And Nixon was in Nixon was that's when Nixon first came back back to Los Angeles. And he would he would visit Eisenhower up there and they would talk and Nixon Nixon was thinking about running. For, yeah, he was being persuaded to try to run against Pat Brown for governor. So he'll have, he would he would he would win in a walk, and uh, and and it, that was bad advice as it turned out. He lost pretty handily to Pat Brown, but he it was also it was also a chance for Nixon to sort of get in trouble with the Republican right wing. He, he had never had that had ever. He, suddenly he was being faced in a primary by the Republican right. Nixon was the was the sort of moderate or or not even the left, but he was the moderate. And he was. And that's when sort of Nixon began to realize that I mean the party was was changing. So yeah, it was a it was a very tough race. And then the, I'm sure you were asking about the, the denouement after he lost the race. He made a speech afterward. He was very upset. He may have had a little bit too much to drink. And and and, and he made this. He talked to the. He said, I want to particularly thank the people in the press corps who who never who never laid off, and so you won't have Nixon to kick around anymore. And everyone thought, well, that was the end of him. Well, of course, it wasn't the end of him. It was just, it was, it was just an, another beginning for Richard Nixon. Just a minute. Right back here, please. Thank you for that. I, I, you, you did an especially good job of letting us know what made Nixon tick. How about Eisenhower? Any, any comments about what, what, was, what made Eisenhower tick? A lot of people ask that question, even those who knew him. He was a mysterious figure. He was a mysterious figure. He would, someone, someone who would, who I remember someone told me, I think it was Ray Price told me, they went, when he had to go meet him in, in, in Gettysburg where he had his the, the farm, and he said he would just go all, four, all five star on you. And he was, a, he was, <laughs> And and he was a he was a distant figure. I'm sure he had his he had his the people who really knew him were his old army friends, uh, and, uh, uh, and and they they knew the real Eisenhower, and he would uh, and, and he would write them send them notes, and he was and you could and you get the some sense of the real Eisenhower in his papers. You can see there's a wonderful he had this reputation for being sort of not not, all, not terribly bright, no, but he was a very bright man. And you can read you can, you can, the, the Johns Hopkins has all of his diaries, his papers, and, and you just read this, this sense of this man who really gave a lot of thought to a lot of things. And he was, uh, and, and he was also a man who was always very calm. He was, um, one of the things I've, I, I, I remember thinking w when I was a kid, my parents were not, were not, uh, were, were Stevensonians. And I remember learning, and I became real, more and more to realize, not only with, not with Eisenhower, how can I say this? We were lucky as hell to have him as president. We were really lucky. He kept his, he was a man who never panicked, 
he, he had a very good sense of, of, of the danger of war, and he, was, and, he would, and he would keep us out of it. The, you didn't ask about, I, mean, I could ask about, the, there was talk about after the French were losing at Dien Bien Phu, Nixon, Eisenhower did everything he could to make sure we did not get involved in that war then. Nixon was pushing, Nixon was, was pushing for intervention, and Eisenhower was, uh, hadn't, so I'll know virtue in, in getting one more Asian war. Yeah. Uh, do you think uh, Nixon or Eisenhower had, even after his death, some impact on Nixon's positions in Vietnam? That, no, I, 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 for far as I can see, no. I mean, Nixon was, Nixon, Nixon, I, mean, I think Nixon really wanted peace, and I guess he wanted, he wanted to end that war. It was a nightmare for him. He was going to, but he, um, Eisenhower, but Eisenhower would, Eisenhower's approach to this was go in with everything you have and win it, and, and Nixon's approach was, uh, and Nixon was not going to do that. So no, I don't think, I think he went his own way. We've I, got I time. I wish Eisenhower had been, had been around. We got time for one more question down here, Deborah. I really admired him, and I think he was very smart. And I'm sorry, him. I, I, I admired him, and I think he was very smart. Yeah, yeah. He said he toured the death camps after the Holocaust, yeah. and he said, "Photograph this, because yeah. in the future, people will deny it." Yeah, yeah, I know. I, he, he said a lot of things at the time. He, he said he turned around and he said, "Do you hate him now?" Talking about the Germans. <laughs> no, but he was. Uh, no, he was. Uh, he would. He would be sort of surprised at some of the denial going on today. For well, sure, for sure. please join me again in thanking Jeffrey Frank. If you want to get your book signed, line up right over here. Thanks again.